welcome to Microfiche Microphone. I'm Micah, and on this channel we look at microfiche from the past, old newspaper articles in the public domain. We look at them with our modern eyes, our modern perspective, and see what we can learn from them. So in case you can't tell, I am just getting over laryngitis. I completely lost my voice for several days. Um, it is coming back. This was literally more than a week ago, and I just feel like I can't put off recording anymore. Besides that, I have this new project that I'm really excited about and I really wanted to share with you and I just don't want to wait anymore. So, um, I've been feeling a little bit bogged down in some of the articles that we've been reading and I just feel like, you know what, I need to get back to something that I am passionate about. So I'm going to make some changes in the channel and I hope that they are positive changes and I hope that you agree with me. If not, Sorry, it's my channel. I make these decisions. <laughs> um, so the major thing is that I want to change what we are reading. And normally we read newspaper articles from the past. And sometimes I, I'm not a historian and I can tell. There are times when I'm not quite sure culturally what's going on. And I feel like I want to concentrate a little bit more on the history that I know more about. And one of my major passions is church history from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's particularly in the 19th century, although early 20th would be awesome too. So that's what I would like to concentrate on. Um, I actually have a couple of websites up um, for reference if you would like to look at them. I have a historical general conferences website where and I've been working on for years and it really really looks amazing now I mean it's still a work in progress it's not finished I don't know if it will ever be finished but we're working on it um, and that's historical general conferences at dot weebly dot com um, and I also have another weebly website and that one is church periodicals and that's very, very much a work in progress. That's going to take forever. What I'm trying to do is digitize some of the old church period periodicals. And as part of that project, I'm, I'm trying to get myself more motivated to work on it because it's such a painstaking, tedious process. It just takes forever. So one thing that I'm going to try and do is digitize a full issue of the magazine every time I bring out one of these videos. So I'm going to start with the Juvenile Instructor. Juvenile Instructor, it was a magazine that was from the church and it began in 1866 and uh, it w ran until, well, it changed its name in 1930 where it changed to Instructor and then it continued to run until until 1970 when all of the magazines were like unified. So it had a very long run. We're talking more than a hundred years. And the first 50 years or so, I don't know exactly, I have to look. Um, no, I think it was more than 50. No, it was 50-ish. <laughs> um, it was 50-ish years. It was, um, it, it came out twice a month, which I think is quite impressive. So there's a lot to look into. Um, however, because it came out so often and because it was written for children, it's relatively easy to read and it simplifies some things. Um, and it's also not very, very long. So I thought, let's look at an issue for every video and just look and see what's in there. Now that would also mean that I'm going to comment on it less than I have, than I usually have in the past. And that is simply because I don't think I'm going to need to, yeah. Um, but I just really find it very fascinating and, you know, what's better than an excuse to read church periodicals <laughs> because it's something that I'm passionate about. Anyways, I hope that you enjoy. Um, I will continue to leave comments on. However, I am specifically going to ask, be kind in the comments. And this is not a place for a philosophical debate. If you would like to do that, you can do that on your own platform. Please don't use mine. Anyways, um, so let's take a look. We are starting with the Juvenile Instructor, number one, volume one. 
uh, Great Salt Lake City, January 1st, 1866. So, it starts out with a poem, poetry, for the juvenile instructor, Little Birds. The earth is covered deep with snow, the streams are frozen fast. The mountain raven circling low with measured wings glides past. The little birds that hop around through all the bitter cold are near our dwelling places found hunger hath made them bold. God gives those little birds his care, he fashioned them with skill, e'en as he made all things that are to serve his holy will. He says not even sparrows fall unnoticed to the ground, and that our hairs are numbered all, he, his love does so abound. Then do not hurt the little birds, even in simple play. They cannot speak their thanks in words, but in sweet chirps they may. Eris. Oh, that's really sweet. Um, yeah, don't, don't hurt the birds, that's really sweet. All right, biography for the juvenile instructor, Joseph Smith, the prophet. So I have to say about this, this is a series, and if I am not mistaken, this series ran for something ridiculous like seven years. Recall, this magazine came out twice a month, 24 issues per year for seven years. That is a lot of articles, and um, so they are going to go through a lot of details about Joseph Smith the Prophet. Um, and uh, but let's it is relatively simplified so let's take a look among other subjects which we wish to lay before our young readers is that of biography or the history of men and their lives and characters we feel sure that every boy and girl in this territory will take pleasure in reading about men and women who have made themselves famous in the world through their virtue and goodness by reading biography they can see the steps which men have taken to make themselves useful and great and obtain many lessons by which they can profit First in this list of great and distinguished men who lived in our time stands the name of Joseph Smith. We expect our little reader, readers have heard of him and know something respecting his life. He was born at Sharon, Windsor County, in the state of Vermont, on the 23rd of December, 1805. Had he lived until the present time, he would have been about 60 years of age. He would not have been a very old man even now, for you know many men and women who are smart and active who are much more than 60 years old. He was the fourth child of his parents, he having two brothers and a sister older than himself. When he was about ten years of age, his parents moved from Vermont to the town of Palmyra in the state of New York. They were not wealthy and were not able to give their children more than an ordinary common school education, but they taught them to be moral, truthful, and industrious, and brought them up to the best of their ability in the fear of the Lord. Some little time after the... So father and family to Palmyra, sorry, I can't read that. Uh, the people in that neighborhood became excited upon the subject of religion. They felt that they were sinners and that they ought to do something to get forgiveness and to please God. There were a great many churches in that county, and all these churches had preachers. These churches were called Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, and others were known by other names. Though all these churches professed to believe in Jesus Christ and in the Bible, they were divided one against the other. Their preachers told the people that they were the followers of Jesus and his apostles. At the same time, they themselves quarreled one with another about the doctrine of Jesus. One said that his church was right, and another said, Not that not that church is not right, but my church is. And they contended, each preacher trying to get everybody to leave other churches and to join his. Of course this produced great confusion and strife, for when the preachers disputed, the people could not agree. Our readers who have been born and brought up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have never seen anything of this kind. They have never seen two or more preachers quarreling about their churches, one saying that his church was right and another contradicting him, and saying that his church was wrong. In this territory, the people do not contend about religion and about which is the right church. <laughs> Cute. The truth which the Lord has revealed from heaven by sending his angels to speak with man has stopped all contention and united those who have obeyed it and made, us, made them one. But Joseph Smith did not have the privileges and advantages when he, was a little, when he was a boy that the little boys who live here have. His parents did not know what your parents know, and they could not tell him what your parents can tell you. During this time of great excitement, Joseph thought deeply on the subject of religion, and he became somewhat uneasy respecting the course which he should take. His family's his father's family believed the Presbyterian faith, and his mother and three of his brothers and one sister joined that church. But he could not tell what to do. The confusion and strife which he saw among these preachers in their churches puzzled him. 
This is not to be wondered at, for he was very young, and did not have much experience, but he believed the Bible and knew that it contained more of the words of God than any other book that he could get. So he paid attention to that, and one day, while reading in the epistle of James, he met with the following words in the chapter, in the first chapter and fifth verse, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. This passage of scripture came with great power to his heart. He knew that if any person needed wisdom from God, he did, for he could find no one who could tell him what he wanted to know. After thinking upon the subject, he came to the conclusion that he would do as James directs and ask of God. On a beautiful morning, early in the spring of the year 1820, when he was in his fifteenth year, he went into the woods alone to ask God for the wisdom which he wanted. In this quiet and lonely place, this humble boy, who wanted to know how to please his heavenly Father, kneeled down to call upon him. It was the first time in his life that he had ever tried to pray with his voice. Soon after he began, a power took hold of him which bound his tongue so that he could not speak and made him feel as though he was about to be destroyed. It was the power of Satan, which was there to fight with him and prevent him, if possible, from getting the knowledge which he wanted. Of course, Joseph was much frightened, for he did not know what it was. He could not see his enemy. He could only feel him. He did not know as much about the power of wickedness and of Satan than, than he did afterwards. But he did not give up. He exerted all his powers, and he called upon God to deliver him out of the power of his enemy, which had hold him. At this moment of great alarm, he saw a pillar of light exactly over his head. It was much brighter than the sun, and it gradually came down until it rested upon him. When it appeared, he found himself freed from the enemy which held him bound. You can all think how happy he must have felt when that wicked power was driven away. As soon as the light rested upon him, he saw two personages standing above him in the air. They had the form of men, yet their brightness and glory were far beyond that of the sun, or anything that we can see around us in this world. No man, therefore, can tell another how beautiful and glorious they looked. To understand this, he must see their glory for himself. One of them called Joseph by name and pointed to the other and said, This is my beloved son, hear him. Joseph had asked God for wisdom, and his prayer had been heard and was now answered. He had the glorious privilege of beholding the Father and the Son, and of being taught respecting the gospel by its great author. To be continued. Um, so that is very much uh, a lot of quoting from Joseph Smith history, which he had written himself. So if you're curious as to where that story came from, Joseph Smith history. And um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, it was almost direct quotes. A lot of it was. So I'm um, I'm not overly concerned about it. I do think it's interesting how at the beginning they're like, oh, people weren't like the way, you know, the way you live now, which is, you know, amazing, and, you know, go us and boo them, you know. <laughs> That's a little much. Like, it just, it just made me laugh a little bit, like how he's trying to, like, connect with the kids. Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, sure. Sure, go ahead. Retell the story. It's not too bad. All right, um, the next article is called, Who Are the Indians? This is already touch problematic, in my opinion, and I'm very much concerned that there's going to be some serious racism in this one, so trigger warning. All of our little readers have seen more or less of the Indians as they go about begging from house to house and from town to town. Many of them have doubtless often wondered where these Indians came from, who their fathers and mothers were, and what they were like. Now, as it is a very interesting subject, and we see the Indians around us every day, we propose to tell our little readers something about them and their history. All the Indians in North and South America, and the inhabitants of some of the islands of the Pacific Ocean, are the descendants of a family who came away from Jerusalem about 2,400 years since. What a long time ago, exclaimed the little ones. Yes, it was a long a while ago, and they had a long way to come and we design to give a short but plain account of their origin and travels, how they crossed the ocean to America, and why their children have become so filthy, dark, and degraded. Oh, gosh. In order to properly understand our story and to make it interesting to them, our little readers should ask their parents or teachers to show them where Jerusalem is on a map, and then trace the course which he, we shall indicate to them from that place to the western coast of America. About 600 years before Jesus Christ was born, there lived in Jerusalem a very good man named Lehi, who feared God, prayed constantly to him, and not only strove to keep his commandments himself, but taught his family to keep them also. 
This man went out by himself one day into the fields and woods near Jerusalem to pray. While praying very earnestly, the Lord appeared to him in a pillar of fire, which came and stood upon a rock before him. The Lord spoke to him out of the pillar of fire and told him many things which made him fear and tremble exceedingly. Lehi then went home to his house in Jerusalem, and feeling weak in body because of the things he had seen and heard, he threw himself upon his bed to rest. While lying down, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him, and he saw the heavens opened, and God sitting upon his throne, surrounded by thousands of angels. One of these angels descended from heaven and came and talked with Lehi, telling him that, in consequence of the great wickedness of the Jews, the Lord was about to suffer the king of Babylon to come and destroy Jerusalem, kill a great many of the inhabitants, and take the rest as captives to Babylon. This was just before what is called, in history, the Babylonish captivity took place. Many of our little readers would doubtless like to know who the Jews were, but where Babylon was situated and who its king was, and also when and how the city of Jerusalem was built. All these and a great many other subjects are connected with the history of the Indians, and we design giving a short account of each separately. All right, that wasn't that bad. Thank goodness there was only a few phrases there in the middle that were really, really bad. <laughs> um, yeah, uh... So basically, this story that they're telling is almost verbatim from the Book of Mormon. So, um, so far, they're not telling you anything that you can't find relatively easily. But um, let's keep going. For the juvenile instructor, bad words. Never use bad words because it is very foolish as well as very wicked. (laughs) Some boys think if they swear, use slang phrases or big and ugly words, are insulting to their sisters, overbearing to their brothers and playfellows, and disrespectful to their mothers, that people will think they are manly and brave, but it is not so. Nobody likes such boys, and they are nearly always mean and cowardly. Good boys always use good language, and are respectful and kind to their mothers and their sisters, and courteous to everybody. The consequence is everyone believes them. All good people love them, and they grow up useful, happy, and respected by all their friends and acquaintances. But when little boys learn to swear and swagger and talk vul- vulgarly, vulgarly, they soon become so bad that no one has any confidence in them. They lose all their friends, become bad and unhappy men, and sometimes end their lives in a very sad and disgraceful manner. Okay, so why are they specifically targeting boys? Hmm. Little boys and girls, as well as men and women, see now, okay, now it's gender neutral, Okay, should remember that Jesus says that we shall have to give an account for every idle, naughty word that we speak. It is to be feared that many of us will have a great many foolish and wicked words and speeches to answer for, that we shall be very much ashamed of and very sorry that we ever uttered. If you should ever feel tempted to use bad words, just think for a moment that God hears you, and though you cannot see him now, yet one day you will have to stand before him and give an account of all you have done and said in this life. Do not then use any evil words and do not associate with any boys or girls who do. If any of your playmates indulge in naughty words, you had better shun them and not play with them until they leave off their wicked habits. Interesting. Try to associate with those who are good to their mothers and fathers, kind to their brothers and sisters, and courteous and respectful to everybody. Then you will learn to be good, and God will love you, and your parents and friends will love you, and you will become happy and useful men and women. Um, a little fear-mongering? Yeah. Don't forget, the day of judgment is at hand, you know. Jeez, calm down, you're talking to children. Ugh, okay, moving on. Death by crucifying. Death by crucifixion, represented here, was a very terrible suffer. It was a very ancient kind of punishment and was usually inflicted upon great criminals. The cross was a gibbet formed of two pieces of wood placed across each other, either in the shape of the letter X or in the form of this illustration, which is supposed to have been suggested by the shape which the branches of trees often take, as hanging on a tree was a manner of putting people to death who had committed crimes, which was used a longer time ago. When the persons who were being put to death were fastened on the cross, which was usually done by driving nails through their feet and hands, they were in some places left to lie on the ground till they died, and stakes or sticks sharpened at the ends were driven through their bodies. Jeez, this is gruesome! In other places, the cross was raised up in the bottom end, driven violently into a hole made in the earth, which often dislocated or drove out of their places, the joints of the persons nailed nailed to it. Jeez. Okay, this form of punishment was in use among many ancient nations. The Romans crucified only their slaves who were guilty of crimes. 
citizens who were guilty of crimes considered worthy of death, having the privilege of dying by some other means. Death by the cross was thought too degrading. Hence it is said that Paul, one of the saints of former days, had the privilege of being beheaded, or having his head cut off, which was a speedy kind of death compared to that of the cross, and not near so painful. While Peter, the president of the twelve apostles, chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ, before he suffered death himself, was crucified. Paul was a Roman citizen, although a Jew, but Peter was not a Roman citizen. The only crime which these ancient saints was guilty of was their keeping the commandments of God, and for this they were put to death, with many others, by the wicked, just as some of the Latter-day Saints had been killed for keeping the commandments which God had given them. The Savior suffered this terrible and shameful death, being crucified between two thieves, and a great many who call themselves Christians or followers of Christ pay a great deal of reverence to the cross, more indeed to the symbol or sign of the manner in which Christ died than to doing what he told them to do. It is not a pleasant subject to talk about him, yeah, that's putting it mildly, but there are many painful things to suffer and to be talked of in life, and if my little readers can learn knowledge that will keep them from suffering much that they otherwise might have to endure, it will be well for them. That is quite gruesome, considering that it was, um, this is a magazine for children. Um, I find that a little bit shocking that they would be so detailed. Um, wow. But hey, I'm, uh, yeah, I have to put a trigger warning on that one too. All right. Um, I do understand why they talked about it though, because remember that this is in the 1860s, the death of Joseph Smith wasn't that long ago. And so it was kind of fresh in people's minds. Not fresh, but like, it it wasn't that long ago. A lot of people, uh, their parents probably knew Joseph Smith if they grew up in the church. So anyways, so it's, it's quite possible that, it, that they were maybe asking themselves why, you know, somebody so high up in the church had to die, you know? So it's possible that that's why, it, that's like the background of like where that question came from. All right, moving on. The Jews. This, okay, trigger warning, possible trigger warning. This uh, may also be racist, um, but I'm hoping it's relatively respectful. Let's see. Every child who reads this has no doubt heard of the Jews. They are to be met with in many countries. Okay, so far so good. And though they live like other people, they are different from them in a great many things. They profess to believe in God and in the Old Testament part of the Bible, but they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They expect to be all gathered to a place called Palestine, where their fathers lived many hundreds of years ago, and to build again the city of Jerusalem, where they believe the Messiah, or the Son of God, will come to them from heaven and save them from their enemies. They believe many other things, too, that they may tell you of again, but now we are going to tell you who they are, where they come from, and who their fathers were. They are called Jews and Israelites and Hebrews. They are called Jews because one of their forefathers was named Judah, and that part of Palestine or the Holy Land where his children lived was called Judea, and sometimes Jewry, for the Jews or children of Judah lived there. Judah's father was named Jacob, but he wrestled with an angel of the Lord who did not overcome him, and the angel named him Israel, which means prince, and therefore they are called Israelites or the children of Israel. One of Jacob's forefathers was named Eber, or Heber, who is the great-grandson of Shem, one of Noah's sons, and from him it is said they came to be called Hebrews. Now, though the Jews are called Israelites, you must not imagine that all Israelites are Jews, for Jacob, or Israel, had twelve sons, and all their descendants are equally entitled to the name of Israelites. The Indians in these valleys are really Israelites, as well as the Jews, for they are descended from Joseph, another of the sons of Israel, and so are the descendants of the other ten sons of Jacob, who are called the ten tribes of Israel, though it is not known now exactly where they dwell, but it is somewhere in the north country, and the Lord will make known to us in his own time where the place is, and reveal many other things concerning them. By referring to the book of Genesis in the Bible, our little readers will learn of Abraham, a very good man with whom the Lord talked at various times, and to whom he made promises concerning his posterity. He was so good a man and so faithful to righteousness that he was called the friend of God. He had a son in his old age named Isaac, who was called the child of promise, and who was the father of Jacob. Thus all the Israelites were the descendants of Abraham, and their heirs of the promises made to him, which were that they should become very numerous, like the stars in the heavens, and that through them all nations should be blessed. Bear with us. 
It will most likely be another month before the second number of the instructor can be issued. Our stock of paper is on the way, but not yet here. And illustrations which are ordered can hardly reach in less than a month. After that, we will endeavor to issue to date the full number of papers. However, to make it semi-monthly, will be printed and supplied to subscribers in the year. Those wishing the present number who have not yet subscribed can obtain it by ordering through the agents or applying to the editor. Um, actually, I'm quite impressed by this article about um, the Jews. It was not at all racist. It was very biblical. Um, so, I appreciate that. So, thank you for not being racist. Good job. 19th century. Okay. Salutatory. Salutatory? Do they mean salutatory? Not sure. In sending forth our little sheet to the public, we do so with at least partial consciousness of its many defects. The matter which it contains has been prepared amid the pressure of other duties, and has not received that attention which we would like to bestow upon it, and which we think it really deserves. We therefore beg our adult patrons to not view this our first issue too critically. Should they perceive faults, which we think it more probable many will, we hope that they will take sufficient interest in the paper to point them out to us, and any suggestions they may offer will be received with pleasure. It is our intention to profit by our own experience, and by every suggestion which the experience and good taste of our friends and the friends of the paper will make unto us, to render this a paper that will be worthy of the patronage of parents and every person who takes any interest in the education and development of the children of this territory. There does not exist a single reason that we can perceive why there should not be well-supported and extensively circulated first-class child's paper published here. No other community with which we are acquainted indulge in such high hopes respecting their young as do the inhabitants of this territory. The most, the most sanguine expectations are entertained in relation to the great future which awaits them. It is very natural that this should be so, for unto us are the promises made, but to have these hopes and expectations gratified, steps should be taken to train our children and to do all in our power to prepare them for the duties that will devolve upon them. It is to aid in this work and to supply a want which has been long felt to exist that the publication of this paper has been undertaken. Money-making has not been the consideration. With us it is purely a labor of love, and we therefore feel the freedom in asking for the hearty cooperation of all friends of the education of the young that under other circumstances delicacy might prevent us from expressing. Though it is intended to publish this paper permanently, still in the beginning we have deemed it wise to narrow the expense to the greatest possible extent until we shall have the opportunity of proving by actual experiment what can be done. The price of subscription to the instructor may seem unreasonably high to those who have been accustomed to the low prices at which periodicals of this description are sold elsewhere. But to properly understand this matter, it must be borne in mind that this paper is not published by a society, enriched by bequests and donations for this and kindred purposes, but by private individuals, who can invest but a comparatively small amount of capital in addition to their personal labors. Self-explanatory. Yeah. January. January is the first, first month of the year. It is called January from Janus, a heathen god of the Romans, that was always represented with two faces, and as the first month of the year it may be said to look back upon the past and forward to the future. A Roman named Numa gave it the name of January, as Janus was supposed to look two ways with its two faces. Janus was not a man, and for no, for no man has two faces. It was only an idol or false god, but those who worshipped it believed it to be like a man. In this country, and in all countries in the north part of the earth, January is in the middle of winter. But in countries in the south part of the earth, it is the middle of summer. Here we have snow and ice in January. It is very cold. There is nothing growing out of the earth which is hardened by frost and covered with snow. But in places that are as far south as this place is north, trees are covered with leaves, bright flowers are blooming, fruit is forming, and the earth is bringing forth for the support of man. It is summer there now, but when summer comes to us, they will have winter. Think of flowers, trees covered with leaves, green grass, and warm summer suns in January. Many would wish to be where they are, but think again that when we enjoy that pleasant season, they who enjoy it will now have winter. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm kind of surprised that they delved into, like, the southern hemisphere. <laughs> but, I mean, it's correct. Good job. Simple science. Snow. The ground is covered with snow. People with nice sleighs drawn by horses or mules glide over it very rapidly, and the sleigh bells that are hung on the animals make very pretty jingling noises. Boys with small sleds are enjoying themselves by coasting or sliding very rapidly down some sloping place on their sleds. They do not seem to mind to tumble in the snow much, 
although it is quite cold. Do any of them ever think what snow is? It is the vapor of the clouds which is gradually frozen, and it usually falls in thin, light flakes, which are quite white, and when enough of them fall, they cover the ground as at the present time. If it were warmer weather, these flakes would be melted and fall to the earth in the shape of rain. Sometimes snow falls in little particles which are nearly round. This is when the air is colder, which freezes them harder. When the wind blows, it has a tendency to break up the broad flakes into fine dust-like snow, which we sometimes see. The flakes are very prettily formed, as you can find by catching some of them, as they fall on the crown of a black hat or on anything black. They are very light, which is caused by the small amount of water contained in snow, compared with its bulk. If you fill a pot with snow and set it on the stove to melt, it will be found that there is only a very small quantity of water in the pot when the snow has disappeared. This proves that snow is not frozen rain, but frozen vapor, which is much lighter than rain. Although snow is very cold, it makes a warm covering for the earth or whatever it covers, for it will not let the warmth of the earth pass away, nor the cold frost get down to it. It is therefore called a bad conductor of heat or cold. Snowballing is a favorite amusement at times, yet sometimes the snow will not form into balls, but crumbles in the hand. Did our readers ever think why snow could be made into balls at one time and not at another? The flakes are formed with very fine points of crystals, and these get mixed together by the pressure of the hand, and hold together forming a ball. But when the snow is frozen quickly, these points are not perfectly formed, and they will not pass in between each other nor hold. There are places in the world so cold that if a steam of iron from the outside is allowed to pass suddenly into a room where people are, their breath will be changed into light snowflakes as they breathe. There is also a country where the snow becomes red, and it is called red snow. It does not fall red, but a minute vegetable which secretes a red coloring matter grows upon it, and gives to the snow a red color. This is away in the north, in what are called arctic regions. In some places the snow never goes away entirely, but remains year after year. If the twin peaks in the east mountains were a few hundred feet higher, their tops would always be covered with snow. They would be higher than what is called the snow line, because at that height it would always be so cold that snow could remain unmelted. There are some places where snow never falls, because it is so warm, even in the winter, that the water vapor does not freeze. In these countries, snow is a great luxury, and so is ice when they can be got at the very warm seasons. You can keep snow unmelted until the middle of summer by making it into hard balls, rolling them into flour, and putting them in a closely covered cro crock, which should be kept in a cool cellar. The flour is also a bad conductor of heat or cold. Interesting that they went into red tide. I didn't expect that. It is not technically a plant, but I think that it was considered one at the time. Anyways, do not eat red snow, you will die. All right, this is actually a couple days after I recorded the first part of this one, and it's just because this one's so long I got interrupted. Um, but I don't mind. Um, so, all right, uh, voices from nature for the juvenile instructor, a tree. Oh dear, a lecture on botany, exclaim no doubt some of my young readers, recollecting the horrid works in their fifth reader of endogenous and exogenous plants, cryptogamias, etc. But when I assure them that I require neither Greek nor Latin, but a young, fresh heart, ready to receive anything that is sweet, lovely, and good, will they not listen to me for a little while? Not a learned professor with spectacles and snuff box dried up behind his books shall I speak to you, but I have invited an old friend of mine that will speak in a language better than Greek or Latin, truer than any book, sweeter than any poet, the language of nature. Our teacher of today is a tree, or rather a fallen tree. In fact, the trunk of a, yon of a tree yonder on the wayside at the mouth of the canyon. What? Can a tree talk? You ask, and I answer, listen to him. He will tell you the story of his own life. You see, my young friends, where the saw has cut the tree, a great number of rings around the center, every tree puts on one of them every year. I counted the rings in this one, and there are 150. This tree tells us, therefore, that there are that he was 150 years old when he was cut down. Why is the tree male? That's weird. From the center to the 39th ring, you see them all fine, even, strong, and regular. Only on one place, we notice them closely pressed together. He wants to tell us by that that the thirty that the first thirty nine years of his youth were spent in prosperity, in company with another tree close by his side, who was, however, suddenly taken away from him. For we see the fortieth ring in that place describing its inter uninterrupted circumference again. But do you not notice on the forty fifth to the forty ninth rings how thinly they look, how close they are together? 
In these years of his life, he had very little to subsist upon. Little snow in winter, not much rain in summer, and he went through a time of famine for four years. But you see how he recovered again in the following years, and made up for the loss sustained. How beautiful and fully developed are his rings now again, up to the 92nd. But what do we see here? The next eight rings are disturbed all of a sudden on this side, as if he had received a severe shock. And do you notice on his outside that long overgrown scar? When he was 92 years old, a flash of lightning struck him, and it took eight years to heal up the injuries he received by it. And we can see on his rings for the hundredth is again fully round. This side of the tree was turned to the weather, for the texture of his wood is stronger here. This side was protected by some rock or mountain, which the lighter color indicates. He was a tree that spread his branches far and wide, for you see the thick stumps yet protruding through his bark, and in the latter part of his life his top was broken off by some storm or wind or other cause. He is now far from his kin, but the seed he has left behind has germinated, and other trees upon whom, like upon his children he has been looking down with pride and gladness, have sprung out of it and adorn yonder mountains. When, my children, this trunk lying at our feet can tell us so much of itself, when the voice of nature, even out of that tree, speaks to us in such true and intelligible words of the works of God, should not think that the finger of the Almighty has written down everywhere the great record of his workmanship, and that nothing is too mean in nature, but that it proclaims the glory of him who made us all. Carl G. Mazur. Um, Carl G. Mazur was a college professor, I believe, of uh, science of some sort. I'm not sure what kind, um, but he was from a uh, an immigrant from Germany. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, I thought you might find that interesting. Okay, for the juvenile instructor, steam. This is a locomotive steam engine with a train of passenger cars behind it. It is called locomotive because it moves from place to place. There are other kinds of steam engines which do not move from one place to another, and they are called stationary engines. This engine and the cars behind it run on rails made of iron and go very quickly. It can go much quicker than any horse. It is driven by steam, and that man who is standing on the back part of the engine just over the hind wheels is the driver. He does not use any whip, but he understands the machinery and knows how to work it so that the engine will go slowly or quickly. He has no need to feed oats or hay or barley to it, but he has a man to help him who keeps putting coal or wood into a furnace that makes the water hot from which the steam is made. Steam is water which has been heated until it expands, or spreads out to about 1700 times the amount of space it occupied as water. You can understand that it will exercise great power when thus expanded. In trying to force its way out, if it is confined as it is in the boiler in which the water is heated, this can be seen in a limited degree by watching a tea kettle boiling, on which the lid is a little loose. The steam, in trying to force its way out, makes the lid of the kettle rattle. If the spout was stopped up, it would do this more violently, but part of the steam escapes that way. And it is when that water is being converted into steam faster than there is room for it to pass off by the spout, that it makes the lid rattle in trying to get out some other way. If the spout and lid were both closed very tightly and the fire under the kettle made very hot, the steam would burst it. This is the power that is taken advantage of and directed by engineers so that it will drive ships through the water and great trains of cars loaded with freight and passengers over the railroads on land. In some countries, particularly in England and the United States, steam is applied to a great many purposes, and it can be regulated so nicely that the machinery which it moves will work a hammer several tons weight so as to strike a blow not heavy enough to break a needle or strike one heavy enough to flatten a large bar of iron. A great many kinds of manufactures are made by steam. That is, steam sets the machinery in motion and keeps it working. These manufacturers are so numerous that it would take up much space to simply name them, and it is likely to be applied to a great many more purposes than it is now. A railroad has been commenced to be built across the plains east of this valley, and also west of it. That is expected to run close by Great Salt Lake City. On it, when it is built, carriages will run like that which our illustration shows, and people will be able to go to New York or San Francisco in much less time than they can now, that they can now do by mule teams. It is a very long time since men began to think that steam could be applied to useful purposes, but it is not such a great while since it really was brought much into use. It has grown very rapidly, though. A man named Robert Fulton, born in the state of Pennsylvania in 1786, was the first man who ever drove a vessel with a steam engine, 
for purposes of carriage that actually succeeded, though others had tried to do it before him, and some have been able to make them go on water. Fulton's vessel was named the Claremont, and she made her first trip between New York and Albany in the autumn of the year 1807. That is a little over 58 years ago. Now there are thousands of steamboats of various sizes that run on the rivers, sail on the lakes and seas, and cross the great oceans in many parts of the earth. The man who first carried passengers in cars, driven by steam on a railroad, was named George Stevenson, an Englishman, who built a railroad between Liverpool and Manchester in England and carried passengers over it in 1837, 30 years after the Claremont had made the trip from New York to Albany, and therefore about 28 years ago. Cars had been driven before that time by steam to carry coals from the coal pits in some places in England, and for other similar purposes, and stationary engines had been used previous to then for pumping, manufactures, etc. To learn much more that is useful and describable to know concerning steam, our young readers must get books that treat upon the subject and study them. So, um, keeping in mind that this was brand new technology at the time, I think it's cool that they took some time to, like, explain it and how it works. Um, I also liked the thing on trees and how talking about the rings of trees would describe it and using a, a specific example. I wish there had been some sort of picture of the cross-section of that tree that they were describing. Um, although I feel like not all of it could be, like, inferred by what they were saying. I feel like they were kind of jumping to some conclusions, but hey. I am sure that tree experts would actually absolutely be able to tell things like that, so maybe they weren't guessing. Yeah. Anyways, acknowledgements. We're almost at the end, so let's make it through. We take pleasure in acknowledging the material aid afforded to us in commencing this little paper by a few of the merchants of this city, as well as of the kind efforts of many of its well-wishers in nearly every portion of the territory. To all, we extend our hearty thanks and invite their continued cooperation in increasing and usefulness and extending the circulation of the juvenile instructor. It is also gratifying to feel the interest which President Young has manifested towards the enterprise and to realize that his best wishes and blessing accompany for it for its success and permanency. Uh, and I don't know what that says, but then through which good may be done, yeah? Um... President Young is referring to Brigham Young, who was the president of the church at the time. All right. Um, we likewise solicit the aid of bishops and presiding elders in the various settlements, as well as teachers and parents, in raising our subscription list to a figure that will enable us to more successfully accomplish that which we desire. To parents and teachers, although it is intended to use the simplest possible language adequate to express the ideas desired to be conveyed to the minds of children, Still, it will be impossible, even if it were desirable, not to use many words and refer to many places which will need explanation, and very probably reference to dictionaries and maps. The benefit thus derived, both to parents and children, will amply repay the trouble. To our subscribers, we shall be glad to receive any contributions or correspondence from our little friends, which will appear when suitable, space permitting. We also hope that they will make free to ask for information upon any subject they may desire, which we shall take pleasure in furnishing so far as in our power. I like that. Yeah? All right. Um, then there's the calendar of 1866, which obviously we don't need, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it was very helpful to just have it there as reference. It's small enough you could also cut it out and, like, put it on your desk or something. Yeah? All right. Last article. We can do this. Try. One day, a little boy was learning to write. He had sur surmounted the difficulty of straight strokes, for difficult they are at first, and a harder copy was set. The child looked at it again and again, but at the sight he was greatly disheartened. It seemed impossible that he could form such lines, and bursting into he tears, he said, I cannot do it. His judicious and kind friend and tutor did not chide him, but taking him by the hand, soothed his troubled spirit and said, The wise and active conquer difficulties by daring to attempt them. Sloth and folly shiver and shrink at the sight of toil and danger, and make the impossibilities they fear. Try. The pupil returned to his task with new confidence. The trifling difficulty he felt was soon overcome, but the lesson he had received was a lesson for life. Often did he relate this incident with interest. Try was his constant motto, and he urged others also to make it theirs. 
There was a schoolboy who, while others were at play, was engaged in mechanical contrivances, either imitating something he had seen or carrying out a plan of his own. For this purpose, he provided himself with little saws, hatchets, hammers, and all sorts of tools, which he learned to use with great dexterity. A windmill was being erected not far from where he lived, and he so often and attentively, attentively observed the workmen that he became acquainted with all its machinery. He now tried to make a model of it, which was frequently placed on top of the house, and was put in motion by the action of the wind upon its sails. Not content with thus imitating the windmill, he formed the idea of driving his model by animal power, and for this purpose he shut up in it a mouse, which he called the miller, and which was made to give motion to the machine. Some say the mouse was made to advance by pulling a string attached to its tail, while others allege that its power was called forth by its unavailing attempts to reach a portion of corn placed above the wheel. Another machine of his was a water clock, made out of a box he had obtained from a friend. It was about four feet high and somewhat like a common house clock. The hand of the dial plate was turned by a piece of wood, which either rose or fell by the action of dropping water. As it stood in his own bedroom, he supplied it every morning with the water it required, and it was used as a clock by the family. If, however, he thus occupied himself and scarcely ever joined in the common games of his schoolfellows, he found great pleasure in improving their amusements. He taught them first how to fly paper kites, and took great pains in determining their best shapes and sizes, and the place and number of the points by which the string should be fastened. Nor was he less attentive to his young female friends. It was one of his most agreeable occupations to construct for them little tables and cupboards, and other utensils for holding their dolls and their little trinkets. Throughout his future life, try was his motto. And what was the consequence? That schoolboy became Sir Isaac Newton. That's awesome. I love that. And I didn't know that that was going to be about Sir Isaac Newton. So, awesome. Um, yeah. I found that very fun. I liked the way that the um, authors tried to speak to children in a way that children would understand. And so it's not too intellectual, It's uh, but it's also not talking down to them as if they were stupid. They just need it simplified. They don't need like too much taken out. Um, I feel like the details about the crucifixion were a little bit much. Also, I could have done without the racism about the Native Americans. Um, <clears throat> other than that, I actually think that this was a really good endeavor and it was really very helpful and quite informative. So I like it. We will definitely be coming back to another, um, uh, I, I may not read the whole thing every time. Sometimes I probably will only restrict myself to certain articles, especially if they're very long, but I thought, I found this very interesting and, uh, yeah. So if you enjoyed that too, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I hope to see you in the next video.